Ephesians chapter 6. I'm just going to read a few verses. I know this as well, and we know this, and we've read it probably a hundred thousand times. But I want to share the thought that keeps coming to my heart. And Father, before I do, I just ask, Lord, in the name of your Son, Lord, I, I honestly, I can't preach without you. I can't teach. I can't share. I can't walk. I can't do anything without you, Lord. So I acknowledge that, Lord. I acknowledge you. You're the one that saves. You're the one that converts and heals. You're the one that gives revelation and understanding, Lord. You're the one that takes the blinders off of our eyes. Lord, you're the one that causes us to triumph in this life. And so I look to you and I ask that you'd bless the ministry of the word and that you would open it up to us this morning in the name of Yeshua. Verse 10 of chapter number 6. Finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the schemes, the blueprints of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places." Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, having on a breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparations of the gospel of peace, and above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And Paul says, and for me, and I pray the same this morning, that utter or this afternoon, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, Paul said, that where am I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So my thought this morning is it's time to stand. That's my thought. It's time to make a stand. So if you've tried to, you know, if we follow the, the, the thoughts the last couple of weeks and kind of where God was calling us to a surrendered time, a surrendered place, a, a place where we're truly submissive and laying down and letting go and getting rid of things, and then God began to give us the thought about the bride and how the bride is, is needing to be cleansed, needing to be washed, needing to be made new again. And so we looked at a part of this sexual immorality that defiles and ultimately can destroy the bride. Do you know that? Just for a moment, sexual immorality can destroy a man or a woman's life on this earth and damn them when they get to eternity. That's the truth. Whatever you believe, it's hell and it's everlasting or it's annihilation, it doesn't matter. Men and women that live in that place habitually, the Bible declares a fornicator cannot enter to the kingdom of heaven. Nor an adulterer, nor somebody that's effeminate. But you know the first group of people that's outside the gate are the timid and the fearful. That's the first group of people that John in the Revelation sees outside of that gate. It's the timid, the fearful are outside. So this morning, I, I want to take a thought just for a moment and preach on the, just the idea of it's time to make a stand. Amen. It's time to stand. Paul said, having done all, therefore to stand, stand therefore. You've done everything. Everything's in order. You've got the armor of God. Everything is there. Now it's time just to stand. And so this morning, I'm talking about an insurrection, not against political parties, not against the government. I'm talking about an insurrection of rising up against the sin and the darkness and the depravity of our age. It's time for you to get stirred up. It's been spoken of in the morning or when we are praying. It's time that you stir you up. Amen. You've got to do it. I wish to God this morning you'd help me preach. Amen. Sitting there like a knot on a log is not going to help me this morning. I want you to say amen, raise your hand, shout, say I don't like it, throw your Bible on the floor, kick it. I don't care what you do. Just don't sit there and look at me like that, okay? Preach with me this morning. 
If I'm honest, it's time that we move and get a lively. David, when he came to the battle, he didn't say, praise the Lord. The Bible says he shouted for the battle. Why? Everybody else was in a trench looking at a giant, afraid to raise their voice. Here come David, this young man carrying cheese, wanting just to be curious about what's going on. And he saw all of Israel and all the banners and the shofar. And he saw Goliath and their ar- his army. And the Bible says he shouted for the battle. It's time that we get a holy shout in us about this battle that we're in because one thing is for sure, whether you wanted to or not, you have been brought into the army of God. You've enlisted yourself when you were converted to God. You were given the sword of the Spirit and you're commanded to watch and to pray. Amen? That's what you're, that's what you're given. It don't matter if you're male or female. That's what you've been given. So my thought this morning is to stand. And it's interesting, my mind has been all over the place for two weeks. I've got so much information. I'm, I'm like, I've got to download so much stuff that as I begin to learn and begin to dig, and you know how things are, God will show you something, and then it's like a catacomb. I mean, you open, you take the lid off, and it goes for miles and splits up into a thousand different places, and you don't know where to start and what's truth and what's a lie and what's error. Well, you don't know any of that until you begin to dig and begin to dig. And so this afternoon, I believe with all of my heart, what we're getting ready to go into, a lukewarm Christianity will suffer severely for it. We can't be lukewarm any longer. We can't let sin dominate our lives, and we can't let sin dominate our culture any longer. Now, I'm not talking about getting mad at the sinner because the Bible declares we don't fight flesh and or blood. Though sometimes they are people there that rise up against us. They are people that say things. They are people that do things. That's the truth. But in all reality, there's a driving force behind them causing them to do that. Remember Job, this mighty man of God that was renowned throughout all of the earth, wealthy, blessed, so much that when the sons of God came, to, to, I guess, as a, some kind of calendar in heaven, they all had to come before the Lord and present themselves. Satan shows up in the midst, and the Lord says, where have you been? He said, I've been to and fro in the earth, walking up and down in it. Have you considered Job? An upright man who fears God and eschews evil. He hates evil. Have you considered him? Yeah, I've considered him many, many times. I bet the devil considered him. But you protected him. You blessed the work of his hands. You've made him to prosper. Take it away. He'll curse you to your face. All that he has is in your hands. Don't touch his life. The Bible says that Satan left the presence of God. Didn't even finish the feast. Left. And then you'll find a process of time that all of these things happen. Now think about this. I'm going somewhere. The fire of God came down out of heaven and burned up some of the stuff that he had and killed some servants. They said the fire of God did it. Their children were in a house. There was a great storm of wind that came, a tornado, a hurricane, something came, struck the house, and it fell on his children and crushed them all and killed them. The Sabians, another army outside of his army and outside of his protection, another nation came in and wiped all of his servants out, took everything that he had, and left. And the Bible says he maintained his integrity. Chapter 2. And it came a time again that the sons of God presented themselves before, the, before God and Satan presented himself. Now this must have been one of those, you have to be here. He presents himself, where have you been? Same answer, I've been going to and fro, walking up and down. Have you considered Job? I have considered Job. Do you see that he holds fast his integrity? He holds his integrity. And the Bible ended chapter 1 by saying, in all of this, he did not sin. He didn't sin. In chapter 2, we see this, and then the devil says, yea, skin for skin. But take your hand off of his body and touch his body. He'll curse you to his face, to your face. All that he has is yours. Don't take his life. And the Bible says, 
Satan left the presence of God and immediately struck Job with boils. He began to sit in ashes and scrape himself. And then, if that wasn't bad enough, the only person that he had alive was influenced by the devil to do what, God, what he told God would happen. She comes to him and says, do you hold your integrity? Curse God and die. That's exactly what Satan told God would happen if he was to touch his body. He spoke and said what? You speak as a foolish woman. Shall we not receive evil or good and not receive evil of the Lord? Naked I came in, naked I go out. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And the Bible says, you know the verse? In all of this, he did not sin with his mouth nor charge God foolishly. He didn't. The fire of God came down. He didn't look at God and said, you did this. A storm of wind came and took all of his children. He didn't look at God and said, you did this. How is that possible? Let me ask you a question. When Yeshua was on the boat and they're getting drowned by the water and the waves and so much that these aged fishermen come to the Son of God and say, we're going to die. Did Jesus, Yeshua, get up and rebuke a fire or a wind that his father sent? Or did he rebuke a storm that the devil sent? Who was trying to destroy the Son of God? And so much that when he looked at the disciples, he said to the wind, Peace be to you. And the winds stopped, and then the sea became still. So what was driving what you could see and what you could feel and what was filling the boat was pushed and drove by something you couldn't see and something you couldn't touch. There was something driving the sea, and it was the wind. Yeshua could have said, peace be to the sea, and the wind could have been still raging. He looked at the wind and said, stop, wind, and the wind stopped, and then the seas became still, and everybody in the boat worshipped him. Why am I saying that? It's time that you and I stand up. Listen, you and I are in such a place in our generation. Truly, there is no other generation like this. I know we've said it a bunch, but there's a reality to what we're saying. There's 100,000 other preachers from this day all the way back that have stood in some pulpit inside or outside and declared the coming of the Lord. And they thought it was their day and they thought it was their time. And that's the truth. But how much more when you and I are looking in a day and time when things are being fulfilled at speed. At speed. Today's technology will be outdated tomorrow. So just for a little while, I want to talk about what it means to stand. I wonder, can we stand in the presence of others? Can we, can we stay intact? This is what it means. To stay family, to stay kingdom, to stay, to, to, stay, to hold together, to sustain. Are we able to do that? In some of my study, there's a man named Manly Hall that has come up, and I've been doing some research on this man, and it's interesting that he was a preacher. He was born in the early 1900s, and he, he got into it. That he had, there was a church that invited him to, pre, to be the pastor, and he came, and they preached, and they accepted him, and he became the permanent pastor of this certain church. He goes on and gets into to spiritualism, and he gets into Freemasonry, and he gets into the occult, and he gets into mythology, and he begins to get so twisted and so messed up. And this is something, I want to read this quote to you that he said. Now, this is in the mid-40s. He writes, We've been trying to fix and undo the cherished error by revising the Bible For the past 100 years, we've been trying to bring an addition to the Bible that is reasonably correct. For 100 years, we, who in the world is we? We've been trying to bring a reasonable addition to the Bible that is reasonably correct. But we've been hindered. Now listen, hear me before I don't hear what I'm not saying. I am not a King James only, but I want you to hear what he said. He said it's those King James only and their every jot and their every tittle that has hindered us. Every jot and every tittle because they, now listen, let me say what I am saying. 
They were so staunch on the word of God and being unmoved by it that they were holding him them back from bringing in something that they knew would lead them far off. And so for a hundred years, they stood against the error that wanted to creep in. Now look at where we're at. Now I'm not going to preach on a bunch of you know, uh, translations. I'm not going there, but I will tell you the truth. There's some that I personally stay away from, and there's some that I stay close to. And if you want to ask me, I will tell you. But there's a reality to the fact that if the righteous foundations be destroyed, what will the righteous do? And this is one of the reasons, and this is one of the things where we've got to get to. How can we stand if we're not standing on a firm foundation? You cannot there is one foundation that is laid, that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. And you build and I build on that foundation. So if you don't have a good working knowledge of the word of God, the Bible declares that in the last days, there will be an error that will come. There will be a deception that will come that many people will believe. It will be tied to a doctrine from a devil. That's what the Bible declares. So this afternoon, as we begin to go through this and look at this, are you able to stand? And having done all to stand, the Bible declares, stand. Habakkuk 2 says this, I will stand upon my watch. I will set upon the tower. I will watch to see what the Lord will say to me And what I shall answer when I am reproved. Listen what else he goes on to say. It will take us three. This is Mr. Hall. It will take us three to five generations to iron out the troubles on earth and bring a conditioning, a world capable of mental and emotional tolerance. So in the 40s, he prophesied that it would take three to five generations to condition the people that they would be mentally and emotionally tolerant. What's tolerance? Sometimes, you know, we, there's a good tolerance, right? When you're when your son is screaming and screaming and screaming and screaming and screaming and you got the ability <clears throat> to be long-suffering <clears throat> and to be tolerable, right? That's a good thing. But this toleration that is not good is when we tolerate sin. We tolerate evil. We tolerate wickedness. We tolerate injustice. We tolerate it so much that we lose our conviction. We tolerate it so much that we're not moved to be broken over our own sin, let alone somebody else's sin. We tolerate it so much that we get into an easy believism to where God loves everything and God loves everybody and there's not a real sense of the holiness of God and His severity. And we view God through the lens of this lovey-dovey gospel that's being preached from most of the pulpits that is not the real God that we're serving. That's another Jesus. The Bible said, if any man come to you preaching another Jesus, another Yeshua, or another spirit, don't receive it. Right? And we're living in a generation and I, just downtown here in Jonesboro, we're preaching the gospel. And this lady comes up. I think Brother Daniel was preaching. And she was a believer. And she was hammering him about agape love and filio love. And that's not the God of love. And God doesn't do that. And God doesn't do this. And God's not like this. And God's not like that. And I told him, I said, I walked up after a few minutes. I said, Brother, you just got to cut her off. <laughs> she's just going to, she's, she's hindering what we're trying to do. Just be gracious. Just say, listen, I know what you believe. I don't believe that. we got to move on because that is not a truth. And this is what's happened. What does Jude say would happen? Men have crept in unaware. You know what that word or the, I guess the illustration that is given in the Greek, it gives the idea of a man riding up on a horse. And out of the distance comes another rider that comes up alongside of him before they enter into the city. Everybody in the city think they came together, but that one came from far off and just walked in with him. That's what it means that they crept in 
without being aware of it. Ungodly men. And this is something we're going to look at this morning. It's time that we learn how to say no to the devil. Amen. Amen. Do you know this? How can you resist the devil when he flee from you when you can't resist your flesh? You can't resist your flesh. And you can't resist the world. How do you have power against the devil when the flesh tells us what to do and we obey? When the world tells us what to act, what to think, what to say, when not to say anything, and we come into an agreement with the world, how can we expect the devil to respond to us when we can't even get our flesh in order and keep the world out of our lives? We won't be able to, and the devil knows that. Back in the early 90s, there was a man, his name was Lester Summerall. A very, very good man of God. Matter of fact, I heard him preach on faith one time. I about threw my Bible away. thought, I ain't even got a faith. You know, I have to listen to him. <laughs> that man had faith. He'd walk into a map on the wall and start claiming things and pray, and it would happen as a map on a wall. It would happen in reality. But one day he was writing a book called Scarecrow. And in the book, Scarecrow, it was about basically that the devil is just, you know, he's under our feet. He's nothing to even worry about. He's a scarecrow. And he said for years, he never could finish the book. And one night, he was trying to go to bed and try to go to sleep. He couldn't rest. And he laid down, and it was about midnight. And as he closed his eyes, he saw a TV screen, and he saw two eyes that were looking at him. And he said, my name is Apollyon, and I'm no scarecrow. And so he wakes up, and he begins to pray into the dream, and he begins to ask the Lord, and this is what happened. This thing, this thing called Apollyon spoke to him, and God showed him. He said, in the last days, there will be three spirits that will come through that thing, and they will destroy and damn America. This is what he said. First was a mocking spirit. Second was demonic music. And thirdly, and probably most importantly, was the occult. So let's look at the first one. A mocking spirit. What does it mean to mock? If, we just, if I just break the word down, if I just look at it, it means to make fun of, to ridicule. And as I begin to think, I begin to think, is there a scripture that talks about that? And somebody was quoting, I think it was Brother Emmett was talking about 2 Peter. In 2 Peter 3.3, 3, what's the Bible say? Scoffers will come in the last days walking after their ungodly lust. The word scoffer means to mock. It's a mocker. And I thought how fitting it was that the apostle Peter, looking now, if you think about this, Speaking of the scriptures, the second books usually deal with the coming of the Lord. Second Timothy, Second Thessalonians, Second Peter. The second books highlight a lot of the coming of the Lord. And so you look at Second Peter, and he says, "Know this: that in that day, scoffers will come. And what are they doing? They're walking after their ungodly lust. So, what does it mean to mock and make fun of?" I don't know about you if you get out of here and you get, to get out on the streets and you begin to really deal with people. But if you do that, you'll find exactly what this means. We're walking down the streets in Colorado. We're waving flags. We're, we're, we're worshiping. And this guy, you know, he thinks he's right. But he looks at me and he goes, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry for you guys. Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry. I said, brother, don't be sorry. He said, no, I'm sorry. So when he was trying to have this false sense of being sorry, but he was mocking everybody as we walked by declaring the gospel and the promise of the living Savior. 
You and I are living in a generation where that world is absolutely, they're not hiding in the closet any longer. They're very open about the mockery of the Son of God and of Christianity in particular. They are open with it. It's no more a game. It's no more they're doing in the closets or the shadows. You and I have crossed over to where we can see men and women tearing the Bible up in public, urinating on it, spitting on it, telling that all these things about Jesus Christ, who He is and who He is. And they're openly and publicly mocking and defaming and degrading the very Savior that we stand for. We have moved in to that place. Let me ask you a question. Can you stand in that type of an atmosphere? Because that's where we're at. Having done all, stand. You've done everything. You've witnessed. You've prayed. You've cried. You've fasted. You've got the whole armor of God. You're quoting the scriptures. You're standing And you're standing, and then all of a sudden, the word comes to you, stand, therefore. Will you be able to stand against the mockery that it not only is here, but that is coming? Again, the mockery means to just to make fun of and to degrade. You ever argued, debated, whatever you want to call, when you get into a a debate with somebody, and they want to tell you all the things that are wrong with Christianity how their brother, their sister, their mother, their father, their neighbor did this, and now for 10, 20, 30 years, they won't grace the house of God because of that, and they're all hypocrites, and everybody's a devil, and all this stuff. A mockery. Jude says the same thing, the exact same thing. The Bible declares that when the flood of the enemy comes in, what will the Lord do? He'll lift up a standard, right? Now think about this. If, if we're going to stand, what do we do in the sight of mockery? When everybody is going the opposite way, how do we stand? What's the opposite of going with the flow of everything? we got to have such an honor and a reverence and a respect for God that even if the world and the flesh and everybody else is going to mock God, we have enough honor and respect for that God that our mouth, like Job, will not open up and say anything that would bring defaming or bring God down or dishonor Him in any bit. That's what we have to do to stand stand in the day of mockery when others are mockering do you know silence silence is powerful and it speaks sometimes louder than words do you know some believe that when adam was in the process of falling And he had taken of the fruit, and God came to him and he said, Adam, where are you? And he said, Well, I've hid myself. Why did you hide yourself? Well, yet that woman you gave me, she did this to me. Do you know that from that moment, God stopped speaking to Adam and started speaking to the wife? And the Bible says, Because you have hearkened to the voice of your wife and done what I told you not to do, curses the ground. And then he moved to the woman. You know what they believe? Some some theological thought there was a transference right there when he said that he gave all that over to her she in turn said what the serpent that you made beguiled me and i did eat well you're going to be cursed in childbearing and she looked at the serpent and passed all that onto the serpent tell me what did the serpent say nothing And isn't it interesting that the Bible declares that he's the prince of the power of the air, the God of this earth, and he owns the whole earth, and he gives the glory of it to whosoever he wants to. It was passed from Adam to Eve to the serpent, and he didn't even open his mouth. Yeshua, standing before the high priest, we have the right to condemn you. We can do all these things to you. What did he do? He held his peace. He held his integrity. You have no power nor authority against me except it was given to you from above. Are you going to be able to stand? What is your basis for standing? When people argue and come against you, where, what, what do you what's your arsenal? What are you pulling your arrows from? Feelings and emotions will fade away. 
Experiences are good. But I'll tell you this, when the world is on fire, there's going to be one thing that stands. Thy word, O God, is truth and is forever. The one thing that won't burn and won't turn and won't go away because not only is it established forever in the earth, it is established forever in the heavens. So even if we did burn it off the earth, God's got a copy in the heaven. Amen. And it will never, ever, ever go away. Is that your foundational stance that you're standing on the Word? Remember that old song, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus? You soldiers of the cross, lift high His royal banner. It must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, His army shall He lead till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. Can you stand up in this generation? Will you be one that will have enough of the honor and the glory of God to stand up and just, I mean, there's a lot in standing up and standing out and walking out and becoming that visible part of an invisible kingdom. Because now all of the arrows and all the darts can be focused upon you and you know you're going to take them and you know it may come in the front, it may come in the back, it may come through your ears, it may come in a thousand different ways. And so what keeps us sometimes is we're unwilling to step out and stand. Every place in the Bible that men stood up and stood out, God honored them. Let me tell you a, let me tell you a testimony that just happened. There was a group of 12 men that went to... Um, oh, Lord, help me. <clears throat> oh, Lord. They went into Asia. I can't remember the exact spot. They went into Asia... And there were 12 of them, and they were witnessing, and they were going around sharing the gospel. This is not old. And so they had a thought. The last day, we're going to go into the Buddhist temple, and we're just going to praise the Lord. Six of them said, we're going. Six said, we're not going. We don't want to fight and deal with the demons. We don't want to do it. And so they said, the leader said, we can't do this. We have to be in unison. So they prayed. They asked again. All 12 decided to go. They walk into this Buddhist temple. They grab each other's hands and they begin to praise and shout hallelujah and worship God. After about 90 seconds, they opened their eyes and there was 200 priests surrounding them in orange robes with their swords drawn, going to kill them. They close their eyes, and for 60 more seconds, they begin to shout hallelujah and praise and worship God. They opened their eyes and they were still standing there. All of a sudden, they split open, and the leading priest, an old 80-year-old man, walked forward to the leader of the other group and said, What God do you serve? He said, Why are you asking? He said, I've been in this temple for 50 years. We're trying to find the true God. And when you guys started worshiping, I saw the true God. Now listen. Him and 100 of the priests gave their life to Jesus Christ that day. The other hundred left. That group of priests began to pray and wanted to do the same thing, so they went to the Capitol and started doing the same thing, tried to get a meeting with the congressman. Wouldn't happen. They began to stand outside and pray. All of a sudden, that man was moved. Another man was brought in who was gracious with men of the faith of Christianity. Now think about that. Would that have happened if they would have stand or would not have stood? You don't know, brother and sister, when you... Now, I'm not talking about trying to just jump on everything, but I'm talking about spirit-led, God-driven, Holy Ghost-pushed, whatever you want to call it. When God does that and you obey that, there is a blessing not just for you because it ain't about you. It is about God's kingdom, but you will be used of the hand of God and you'll see something that not many eyes will see fighting against this messed up, broken, mocking spirit. He moved on and he began to talk about demonic music. And it's interesting to me that, again, this is in the early 90s. So we know what come out of 80s and 90s, you know, we had, you know, hair bands and acid rock. And then we had all this stuff. And then again, began to get darker and darker and darker. Got into Pantera, got into corn, and it got into Slipknot and all. It just kept getting darker and darker and darker. Not that Ozzy and all those guys were not dark. They were, and they were devil worshipers. We see that. But it just seemed on a mass scale, it got darker and darker and darker. And he saw that 
early on. But you know, I'll be honest, I believe with all of my heart, there is something connected to this great push that we have called worship in the church and the end time of a global community coming together. Do you know why I believe that? Because in Daniel, there is a type of it. There's an image that is set up. There's a man that is leading it. And he says, when you hear all the sound of music, fall down and worship this image that I have set up. So I believe with all my heart, when you begin to scripturally look at some songs, and we've had to weed out some stuff out of here, because scripturally they're absolutely incorrect. They feel good, they get our feet moving, they get our hands pumping, but at the end of the day our hearts are far from God, and scripturally they're bending us in a way that's more humanistic than it is God-centered and God-focused. And it's slight, and we don't realize it, because this battle started many, many, many moons ago, and now we're feeling its effect. To now, you can look at most mega churches, and it's more of a concert than a time of brokenness and repentance and drawing near to God, getting our hearts right, and not being in a hurry. No matter how much we dance or don't dance, we're looking for one thing. Did we find the presence of God? And when we find it, we're parking here, and God ministered to us as we minister to you. Now, I'm not just preaching all against contemporary music, some of it's not good. It's the truth. You've got to guard yourself. Not everybody that says they're a Christian, they're not a Christian. Do a research. Do a study. Watch their lives. I don't care what kind of conversion they think they had. When you look at their life and they're still living the same way, that kind of conversion is no good. And you've got to discard that when you look at their life because God's going to look at their life. Amen? And the third part it's interesting, too. What does the Bible say in the end? There were three spirits that came out of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Revelation chapter number 16. Now we're going to look at this last block. The occult. And this is a burden on my heart. I know that you guys probably think I live in demonology, but I don't. Matter of fact, I got away from it for many months, and then all of a sudden, as God does, there's just things kicking up, and things come to me, and people are asking, and all this stuff. But let me give you a real statistic. 1,600% increase in the last couple of decades of the occult. 1,600. You know how much Christianity's went up? 7%. So 1,600 has the occult gain ground. And I'm not talking about a cult, like just C-U-L-T, because a cult is just any organization that wants to exalt a person or a text above the Word of God could be determined a cult. I'm talking about the occult. I'm talking about witchcraft and sorcery and all of this stuff. Now we went from Facebook to TikTok. Now we have witch talk. And they're doing incantations and spells. They're, they're teaching the young generation how to do that. Do you know this is the only and the first generation that parents and pastors are not the greater influence of the children's life? Now they can get all over the world and this is their influence. They are being influenced on every part. You tell them something, they'll go look and see what other places and nations and people are doing. You share with them something, and they'll go looking at that, and they'll go scrolling here, and they'll get a reel here, and they'll get a TikTok here, and the word that you're trying to instill in them is being stolen and raped and raked away from them because there's an influence that's in their life. It's the truth. I'll tell you a scary thought. You get to study in flat screens and black screens and all that, and it'll go into a rabbit hole, but you'll find out the occult has used that for hundreds of years to divine and to call out images and to look and to see. That's the truth. So one of the things that God's put on my heart, 30 days, if I have to take the TV off the wall, which we don't even hardly use it. It don't get cut on hardly ever if I'm there. Now, I hear people, I hear some feet scurrying around when I get home. I, you know, I'm walking the door, they're like, hey, Dad, how you doing? I'm like, what are you doing? Nothing. I mean, their eyes are bugging, you know. I'm like, Timothy, or Solomon comes up, Coca-Melon? Coca-Melon? I said, oh, Coca-Melon. 
You're watching Coco Mountain. Well, he was crying. I said, I don't want that to be his babysitter. You be his babysitter. Right? I understand it. Trust me. The other day we played this game. I don't know if I shared it with you. probably did. He was screaming, throwing a fit, throwing a fit, throwing a fit. I grabbed him, put him on the bed. I said, stop screaming. Sit down. I turned around. He stood up. I turned around. I said, sit down. I pushed him back down, set him down. I said, now, good boy. I turned around. He stood up. I turned around. He said, sit down. I said, sit down. He said, good boy. <laughs> and he sits down. I turn around. He stands up. And I turned around. He said, sit down. I said, yes. He goes, good boy. <laughs> so we played this game for about five minutes, which was cute. Amen. After that, I wasn't mad anymore. <laughs> I'm like, boy, you're a joy. You know, I, I love you. A couple children ago, they've been, they've been bad. But you, <laughs> you got grace, son. Yeah. Lexi, yeah. Don't ask Lexi. Don't ask. But there's a real thing there. You and I are living in a generation that has not ever known that wasn't there. And I know we can use it for educational purposes. I get it. But I'm telling you the truth. They're not only letting us watch stuff. They're watching us. And they're looking at us. And they're hearing us. How often can you have a phone and have a discussion and then all of a sudden there's an ad about what you just said? How many times have you been praying and or you've been doing all kinds of stuff, not a call, not a text, not a nothing? You think, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for a minute. You open a Bible, somebody's texting you, it's an emergency. And you're like, good grief, how is this even possible? I think, and I'm not a conspiracyist, but I think there's more to this battle than we actually realize. You and I are fighting a battle and a war. Do you know that, <clears throat> now these are trained therapists. This ain't just me. This is a trained therapist. They said that all of the patients that are coming to them, they're having some, some psychological problems, 93% are from satanic ritual abu abuse. 93%. A psychological magazine published an article and said this. I want to read this to you. Stated, there seems to be an invasion of some mystical force that is driving our children to the brink. Now this is trained, ordained, schooled men and women that understand the mind and its workings. That are looking at people that are coming to them and saying there's something mystical about this. There's something that's more than just depravity and, and uh, hard-headedness and a little bit of rebellion. There's something else that is pushing and driving this in our generation. Do you know that 50% of the United States of America's citizens claim they have some type of contact with the dead? Half of the United States claims they somehow, some way, have had contact with the dead. Now listen, that's a lie. You don't contact the dead. You contact the demon, you get a hold of a devil, but you ain't talking to aunt anybody or uncle so-and-so. That's the truth of Scripture. But in their mind, because of, like Saul, trying to figure out, trying to grab a hold of something because not, God's not speaking, they're reaching out in this generation like never, ever before. And this is something I'll, I'll leave with you, and I'm just about done. <clears throat> and this, this really s settled on my heart. When you get into deliverance and demonology, there's a lot of people that have gone way, way, way far, and they know a lot more than me. And I remember listening to Wynn Worley one day, and he was just going through a list of stuff, saying, if you did this, you're cursed. If you did I mean, he was kind of nonchalant about it. You did this, you're cursed. You're cursed. You're cursed. Your children's cursed. Your, da your dad's cursed. And I'm thinking, man, that's kind of rough. But just the other day, I'm at the gym, and I'm listening to this. I'm listening to this man of God preach, and he makes a statement that I thought was amazing to clarify this. There's a reality that God has cursed certain things and they bring a curse. That's just a reality. Cursed if you do this, cursed you'll be. Deuteronomy 28, 29, right? Blessed if you do this, blessed you'll be. If you do this, you're blessed. 
The verse of Scripture that stuck out to me was, remember when, when Joshua goes in, and he goes into Jericho, and he's going to destroy Jericho. Now, it's interesting that Jericho is claimed to be the oldest city that's been inhabited on the earth. That's what they're claiming. And it's, it's also interesting, there's this big old, they said it was a window, but if you've ever seen CERN, and you looked at this gate, it looks identical to it, but it's made out of stone in Jericho. But when Joshua came, and they marched around it, and God didn't knock it over like this way, because the walls were so wide that the chariots could race, so if they would have knocked it over, it would still been as thick as it was wide. God shoved it down in the ground, and it became flat. They walked, the Bible says, every man walked straight forward. It didn't say they were climbing over rocks and over broken pieces of the building. It fell down flat, and they've proved that now. And Joshua utters a curse. Cursed be the man that builds this city. He will lay its foundations in his firstborn, and in his youngest sons he'll set up the gate. Now think about this. You do a research on Jericho. There were people still living in Jericho all the way through the time of Christ. So the curse wasn't to those that live in Jericho. The curse wasn't to those that walked through Jericho. The curse was waiting on somebody to actually begin to build that wall again. And the Bible declares in Kings uh, chapter, 1 Kings chapter 16, it names the man that took upon himself to build it. Now think about this. He starts building the walls of Jericho. And the Bible declares his oldest son died during the setting up of the foundation. And when he finally got the city built and he stuck the gate in, his youngest son passed away. Fulfilling the prophecy or the curse, whatever you want to say, of Joshua. And then all of a sudden, I'm listening. And could you go back in your mind and see this man? Now listen, we're talking four or five, maybe 600 years from Joshua to the building of the wall. Did he forget? Did the society forget? Was, the, was that thing out of sight and out of mind and nobody's talking about that crazy old preacher that pronounced a curse on somebody that would build this up again? Did he just not care? Was there money involved? I don't know the answer, but I know he started building. And while he's building, there's a word that comes to him, your son is sick. He's deathly ill. You need to stop and come. So he goes home and he checks on his son. His son gets worse and worse and worse and dies. What did the son do? The son didn't do anything. He continues to build the city. He continues to build. Do you know the Bible declares that in the time of Elisha, that's where all the prophets lived in Jericho. The school of the prophets was in Jericho. So now he's getting it done. And all of a sudden he begins to set up the gate. He gets another word. Your youngest son is sick. He's dying. Come. He comes. He looks at his other son. His son is perishing. He's dying. They don't know what's happening. They're hooking him up to every machine. The scans, nothing's there. No, we don't see anything. All the blood work is good. Everything is in order. Hear me. And he dies. And then all of a sudden, I begin to think about the Scriptures where God tells us, don't bring the things that are cursed in your house. Don't let their names fall off your lips. All of these scriptures that we are so far, I am so far removed from that I don't realize that sometimes there's a reality and a curse and things that are pronounced on that. Now listen, if I was the enemy, would I just want you to get something in your house that I could have right to, that I could say that's mine, therefore I have a legal right, and I know this is a little bit of deliverance and we're not going there, but I'm telling you the truth. If there's, a, there's something that's given access or something that says, okay, I know you're rebuking me, but you're not rebuking the flesh. You're not rebuking the world. And there's something in here that belongs to me. And so all of a sudden, I'm not talking about the vineyard. I'm talking about me. All of a sudden, I begin to examine my heart. I begin to examine the things that I brought in. I begin to examine stuff. And I wonder about you, honestly. 
How much witchcraft, sorcery, divination do you have in your home? I'm talking about movies. I'm talking about books. I'm talking about everything. We think it's what, it's just a novel. It's got a demon on the front of it. It's got a wizard and a warlock. They're doing spells to get love. Don't bring it into your home. Why? Because there's something tracking that thing and coming right in with you. That's the truth. I'll give you a, a short story. One time whenever we were, I was with Brother Matthew, and we were cleaning out a, sto- I don't know if you remember, we were cleaning out a storage building. And this truck driver pulls up, and she's got this big old white, like, stuffed tiger. And she looks at my, one of my daughters, and she's like, can I give that to her? I'm like, well, sure, I don't, I don't care, yeah. Gives it to her. I take it home that night. Nobody can sleep. My daughter's scared. She's got nightmares. And I'm, I'm like, this is kind of weird because she never was like that. And I reached out to Brother Matthew, and I just made a passing remark. He said, yeah. he said man, there was just something about the when she gave that. I thought, man, there's just something about it. He said, if I was you, I'd get that out of your house. I said, I done did. And my daughter didn't have any more of that. Now, I'm not saying that she hexed it and hoped on it. But I'm saying there's a reality to things that we don't know. Do you know that one of the deliverance leaders down in Georgia wanted a Koran? He wanted to study so he knew about some stuff. So he went to a bookstore, bought one, took it in, and at the end of the day, took the book, stuck it on his shelf, and left. When he came back, all of his books were thrown in the floor. Every one of them. And he thought, I didn't even pray over this book. He prayed over it, put them all back on the shelf with the Koran. Not another problem. What am I saying? I'm saying there's a possibility that some of the things we're fighting is our own fault that we brought in. We've allowed in. We've given biddance to. Because of the amount of the occult, the amount of sorcery, the amount of witchcraft that we are dealing with is so predominant that we don't think about everything like we do or should do sometimes, myself is included. There's things that I have compromised on. And I'm not talking about bringing any kind of witchcraft or sorcery. There's none of that stuff in my house that I know of. But I don't always know sometimes what a computer may pop up when I'm not home. I don't know what book somebody might carry in. I don't know what sometimes things happen. I don't know. I don't, I don't see everything. But I know sometimes I've been brought into a place that there's something that's just not moving when I tell it to move. So I want I can encourage you with me. This next 30 days, I'm really, matter of fact, I'll be honest. I walked in today and went, went in one of the children's room and I looked and I thought, it's right there. <laughs> how in the world? How, how did I do that? How did I allow that? You know why? It didn't, I didn't see it. So I want to encourage you to really take this next now listen, I know that it's the we're going towards the feast and it's the month of Elul, but just be honest. Even if it wasn't Elul, you still should do it. You don't have to have a roll around festival to tell you to repent, fast, and pray. Yeshua didn't say when the feast come and you fast. He said when you fast, do this. When you pray, pray like this. So it's... It's a, I mean, it's, you, we should do that as a natural recourse of being tied to God through faith in the Son of God. That's natural. So when you're doing these things, pray. When you fast, fast. Because in our generation, will you be able, hear me, will you be able to stand against the occult that's coming? It's here. But there's something greater even than that coming. And we know that. Do you know the Bible declares in Revelation that Polyon is going to take a lid off a pit one day. And there's going to be something that crawls out of that thing. And there's a thousand interpretations on what that is. But we know what it looks like, right? Has hair like a woman, teeth like a lion. It's got wings. It stings men. And the sting is like that of a scorpion. Right? And men are tormented for five months, but they can't die. 
So what does a scorpion sting produce in the body? That'd be something good to study, wouldn't it? If this is what it produces, this is what happens, and this is what John can like in what he sees. Do you know it's interesting that when Paul was talking about the latter days, the last days, he said perilous times would come and men would be fierce. Do you know that that word fierce, not in the Greek, but just in the English, is also used of the gathering demonic that this man coming out of the tomb was fierce. He was unable to be bound. He broke chains and fetters. He wandered around in the tombs and the graves and the caves until he met the Son of God. Could it be that there's a real surgence of the occult in our day that we're not just fighting depraved flesh? We're not just fighting worldliness as we have fought to this time. There's a real push and a real spirit of antichrist in this age, and a lot of it's political, but it's not all political. And it's driving us and pushing us. Will you be able to do this right here? Having done all, you're suited up. You've got the helmet on. You've got the sword. You've got the shield. You're suited up. You've done everything. And now all you can do is stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins with truth. You know where the loins is? It's, the, it's where all of your strength comes from. You ever hurt your lower back? You can't pick nothing up. You can't push nothing. I mean, you can't even hardly pick up a bottle of water because for whatever reason, all of the strength that you had is now gone. And so now you've got to prop yourself just to get enough strength to get a bottle of water to your mouth because you've hurt yourself. The place where we have to be strong is in the truth. What is truth? Thy word is truth. What will stand when this world's on fire? Thy word is truth. Daniel, what about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They stood. I'm not bowing. I know God is able. I'm not bowing. And God done a mighty thing in those three men and so much that the Son of God honored them with His presence. Amen. Will you be able to stand? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. I just ask, Father, for grace to be given to us, myself included, that I would learn how to stand in this generation, Lord. Lord, I want to stand. I want to stand not just on the truth. I want to stand in the truth, Lord. I want to be a part of the truth and have the truth to be a part of me, Lord. And so I ask that for myself, and I ask that for this body, but I also ask for it for the body of Christ, that you would well equip us. Father David said that you teach our hands how to war, Lord. I, Father, I pray that you'd make us a real soldier in this generation to stand, being strong, having the full armor of God on, having truth, Lord, being able to stand in this generation. Father, even of this congregation, rise up men and women to stand in the jobs, in their home, in their society, Lord, in, in, their, in, their, in their neighborhood to stand and be a beacon of light and a beacon of truth and to be light in the place that you planted them. Father, may they no more cower and be cowardly and timidly. Father, going along with the crowd, may they stand, Father, with a back like a crowbar and declare the word of truth, Lord. I ask this for myself and all of the congregation, Father, and I ask this in the name of Yeshua. Amen.